morning. Uh, my name is Chris Herring. I am from NBC Universal. Um, I am thrilled, we are thrilled, to be keynoting DrupalCon. It's such an honor for that to happen today, um, to be able to present the first session here at DrupalCon Portland, so thank you for attending. Um, there's an overflow room, I know, somewhere, so I think uh, we have plenty of seats. Um, so uh, today we're going to tell you a little story about uh, how we operate um, in terms of building a pro product, a Drupal-based product that NBC Universal brands can use to build out their web experiences. Um, but I think I'll give you a little context first. Uh, Adam and I work for an organization, a centralized organization, uh, which is called very creatively Operations and Technical Services. Um, and uh, I run a product development team that's really focused on building this product. We don't build websites. We build a publishing system that brands use to build out their websites. Um, there is a, a, a partner team of ours, or a peer team of ours, that actually has some resources to build out web experiences for those brands that don't have their own development resources. But our team's focus is on building that core product. Um, also with us is uh, Mike Bailey, and they'll do their own introductions when they go. Mike is the director of technology for SciFi, one of our uh, leading brands, and SciFi has been a real partner in this initiative for us. So as we get started, we're going to try to answer four questions today. Hopefully we answer a lot more, but please feel free to ask questions at the end. Um, Adam's also got a purple pen, and he can do some autographs if you guys would like one at the end. Um, but really, the four questions we're going to try to answer is, um, what did we build? And I'll talk about what we built um, using the internal open source development model that I mentioned. Um, and I use that IOSS acronym specifically because I'm trying to gain some traction behind this. Um, internal open source is uh, a relatively new term. Um, it's sort of counterintuitive because we all think about open source as very open and very public. But it's hard for large companies like our, or like our own to participate in that model. So we're really trying to harness the same thing, the same ideas and the same uh, processes internally. And we'll, and we'll talk about what that means in a moment. Um, also, if, if this sounds like a good model to you, you know, how can you encourage involvement within your own companies or your own businesses? Um, Mike is specifically going to talk about how NBCU brands use this model and use our core product. Of how he does that. And then Adam's going to uh, come up and talk about um, how Agile enables this model to be successful. So, uh, first and foremost, what do we mean by internal open source development? Well, there's no difference, right? It, li like I said, it's the same thing as regular open source uh, development, but instead of using the general public to achieve some goals, we're trying to harness multiple development resources within the company. Um, to, do, to achieve the same goals, to build this core product that all brands can, can use. So, you know, it's no different. Like I said, it's, it's so I think a little con context would be helpful. So NBC Universal, the way it's organized is there's multiple brands, obviously, around the country and around the world that have their own development resources, like I said. But, you know, to us, instead of building core functionality that's similar across all of those brands and all of those websites, it makes sense to build something share it and continue to improve it over time. Um, and, and we've really tried to harness that model by just fostering open communication and being very transparent about what this core team is building and how we're building it. We call Our product is called Publisher, um, also very creatively named because it publishes content to the web. Um, but, uh, you know, so I think some, some really good examples are, you know, things we all sort of take for granted in this business. You know, if there's an analytics module for measuring web traffic, there's no reason for each brand to build that out separately, right? We should build that once and leverage it across all of those brands. Um, so, you know, I use this slide to sort of portray the, this idea that, you know, instead of 10 people working on building one small idea, we should build one great product that all brands can use. So some of the things that we've built, um, some of the core features of what we call Publisher 7, which is obviously uh, based on Drupal 7. Um, Publisher 7 comes with uh, core content types that brands can just use as is. Um, these include things that are specific for entertainment businesses in particular, things like. 
like um, uh, posts and uh, persons or person content type um, things like obviously media and photo galleries or media galleries as we call them, um, TV shows, TV episodes, TV seasons, things along those lines. So we should brands shouldn't have to create those content types, you know, each time. Um, we should create them once, and then if a brand needs to just add a field to that content type, they can do that. Um, obviously, I mentioned the analytics module, the Dart module for uh, integration with our ad systems. Um, NBC Universal uses Dart, and NBC will be using DFP. And, you know, the benefit there is that, you know, we have members of the team that actually, or a key member of the team, our tech lead, um, who actually build and maintains the Dart and DFP modules for the Drupal community. And so not only are we building something uh, once and building it for uh, the entire company, but we're also sharing it with the community as well. This is all part of that internal open source model that I'm, that I'm talking about. Uh, we have an identity system. We don't use Drupal for registration. We use a um, custom-built identity system that the company maintains. We call it IDX. Exchange, um, and that also is something that's just built once. And you, you, obviously, there's a trend here. This is what we're trying to do, so brands don't have to keep repeating that effort. Um, Mike's going to talk specifically, I think, about this uh, one piece, which is the integration with uh, our video services provider called Bub Platform, lowercase T, capital P. Um, that's literally the name of the company for those of you who haven't heard of them. Um, and the reason why. Well, one of the big reasons why we use them is our parent company, Comcast, also owns the platform. So, again, we don't want to have each brand have to build those integrations um, with these third parties. That's something that this core team should do and share very openly. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I created this slide to sort of give a, some perspective. I don't have to tell this audience about the Drupal ecosystem and how large it is and how many modules are available, but. This is not to scale, by the way. It's a little publisher uh, circle there. But, you know, essentially we have 13 developers committing code to publisher. Only five of them are part of the core team. So the majority of the people that are committing in terms of number of people are outside of the core team. And that's a real success from my perspective. Um, it's not that they commit constantly. It's that they have the ability to commit, and they do. Um, the publisher distribution, as we call it, comes with uh, over 90 modules. Um, most of them are contrib modules, and we um, patch them when we need to, and we uh, contribute that back, and we're very happy to do that. And, you know, the, the publisher ecosystem, as I call it, is made up of about 50 community members, so if there's only 13 developers committing code, the majority of those community members are other people. They're QA resources. They're um, product people. Obviously, support and infrastructure people that focus on you know the infrastructure for the site. So um, that number is growing, and we continue to have that. We continue to hope that that growth grows as uh, more and more brands use Publisher throughout the company. Um, the other thing that's important there is we have we're, we're we're very serious about documentation for Publisher in terms of features and how to configure certain modules. And so a lot of the um, community members. For So, you know, one of the questions I get asked a lot throughout the company is, you know, publisher sounds great, we want to get involved, we want to use it for our site, um, how do we get involved and what can we do? And I, the best answer I can have for those brands is you really just have to jump in. Um, I'm very fond of um, uh, Angie Webchick's uh, idea of duocracy, and that's really, we're really, really trying to follow that same model, it's just sort of similar to Nike, right, just do it, like, literally just get involved. And one of the, uh, I'll just give you a few examples of how we encourage brands to get involved. So first of all, we have this internal blog that we maintain for the product and talk about, um, you know, just what's coming up and what are the goals of the product and what are the latest, what's in the latest releases. Um, this is really important and it's very easy to maintain. Um, I've been personally maintaining it for a while. Um, there's a few other members of the team that maintain the release notes in that sort of area, but um, I, I think just setting up a blog internally and sharing it with whoever your internal customers are at the end of the day, it's just important. It might not get much traffic. It's certainly not going to be, you know, a high volume uh, web 
website or anything. But it only takes a few seconds, a couple of times a month, just to update it and give people an idea of what you're working on. And it's a great way of sort of fostering communication and, and always having that single place where you can point people to get more information about your product or your, your system. We also leverage uh, user voice for getting um, some sort of feedback and ideas from various stakeholders for the product. Um, I like user voice. It's pretty good. It's not the best, but at least there's a place where somebody can say, hey, I have an idea for a publisher. Where can I go and how can I post it and, and make sure that it's important and make sure that it's not really As I mentioned, uh, we're very serious about documentation. We use uh, Wiki only because, not because it's the prettiest, not because it's the best, not because search is the best, but because it's easy. Um, it's very easy to maintain that documentation. It's very easy to update it. It's also very easy for of that documentation to the brands, um, let, give them an opportunity to say, hey, you know, if they fix something and contribute it back to the core product, well, they can also have to take the documentation without having to know, you know, where that version of the document is or anything like that. They just go in the wiki themselves and then it. Um, so a few other ideas about how you can foster uh, encouragement or uh, encourage people to be involved in, in the product if this is something that sounds interesting to you. One thing we did is just set up a general um, distribution list or email address where, again, if people are a li little, I don't know, just hesitant to get involved, they can just email, right? They can just, everyone's comfortable with email. They can just send an email and say, hey, how do I get access? Or, hey, where can I find more information? And it goes to about 14 people on our team, and anyone can just reply to it and say, here's the link or here's the information. All of our code, um, again, in a great open source model, all of our code is on GitHub, although you need access to it, so we share it internally and we give all the brands the right access that they need. Um, our team is very fond of our IRC chat room. Um, they get a lot of questions from other um, uh, developers throughout the company through that IRC chat room. And um, I have to say, it's one of the best ways of uh, communicating sort of developer to developer with them. They get myself and other members of management out of the way. We don't need a meeting to go over, you know, specific technical details. You can hammer that out directly uh, with the developers uh, in IRC, and that's been a real success for us. I also personally maintain a, a Twitter uh, feed for our product. Um, and again, it's just, you know, when we get together and do our iteration planning or whatever we're doing in terms of activity with, uh, with the product or the team, try to take a picture of it and, and just, you know, say something about it on Twitter and, and give the team credit for what they're doing. Again, all, all of this is just, you know, with the idea of just fostering open communication about, about our product and our, and our process. The other thing we've done recently is we set up this idea of an editorial review board. It just takes an hour every other month. Um, and what we're doing is we're giving people specifically our most important um, stakeholders, which are the edi editors that use the product every single day. We're giving them the opportunity to speak directly to the, to the team about what is important to them. It's also an opportunity to just demo anything that's changed from the last editorial review board. Just show them what, what's changed in the interface or what modules we now include or you know, what, uh, what UX has been improved. And you know, it's a very targeted uh, meeting, uh, demo if you will, for, like I said, the people that are most important, to, which are the editors that use it every single day. So that's really all I have for right now. I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about how Sci-Fi uses publishing. Websites like uh, sci-fi.com, chillertv.com, Blaster Device, our tech and entertainment blog, um, sci-fi games. Um, we also support a lot of other applications on a lot of other platforms. You've probably heard of some of them. iOS, Android, uh, Xbox, Roku, um, Windows 8, Windows Phone. Um, and with, you know, with our large team, we needed to come up with a better way That is, we partnered with Chris about a, a I guess about a, about a year ago now, um, to really figure out how we could bring 
leaders inside of our company together to work more efficiently, more uh, agile. So we chose uh, Drupal and open source as the way to go because we wanted to tap in. There's lots of great developers around our company and NBC and Comcast and uh, we just needed the resources to be able to tap into those developers to be able to really help us all develop our, uh, our core competency, which is really uh, distributing video, uh, distributing content. Um, so I'm going to go through a few uh, bullet points of that. So uh, smaller teams contributing together make one big team. Uh, you know, like I say, most of the sites at NBC have really small dev teams. Uh, just trying to become a bigger team that can do more work uh, faster. Um, a single code base. So this is a huge one for us because you see that we op operate and manage lots of different properties, web properties, uh, you know, device, uh, merging media properties, merging devices properties. Um, we needed a way to limit that down to a single code base so we could really push out um, the core functionality to all those platforms Outside vendors make our life easier. So uh, before this Drupal product, we were in a really proprietary system where we couldn't uh, we couldn't pay a developer enough to get into that tangled uh, mess of code to do anything um, because it was so integrated with uh, so many different products from you know, NT to a uh, hybrid version of Drupal to uh, you know whatever else we were using. A lot of Stuff. So, um, being able to utilize outside vendors now is making our life a lot easier. We end up with, uh, you know, our friends at Lullabot and Optia um, to be able to build stuff along with us and then contribute that code back into the core platform, um, which is great. So, uh, like Lullabot just completed um, building Chiller TV for us, they were able to contribute a lot of their um, code, or we're in the process of contributing a lot of that code back to the core platform. That will hopefully benefit the rest of the company as well. Um, and then our contributions can help the Drupal community solve problems. So we have a, um, really big scaling problems, you know, uh, which aren't bad problems to have, don't get me wrong. Um, but we can really help out the community of Drupal developers understand how our growing pains can help the, you know, the, the blogger out there that's building the site or the e-commerce site that, you know, that developers are making and figure out how they can make those uh, products you know, handle lots of traffic. Um, so I'm going to talk about a, a module that we kind of built in in-house in and it really kind of encompasses everything from internal open source to um, you know other companies and other Google developers and that open source model. So we built this uh, module for the platform, which is Chris had stated is our uh, it's our video platform. It's what delivers video to our um, all of our sites. So not necessarily the files themselves, but it's the CMS behind the metadata behind those videos. Um, so we built a module for the platform. Pretty simple module. I'm just going to brush on it pretty quickly. Um, you create a you know you create your your feed. So everything out of the platform is feed driven. So you enter a few feeds for your player for your what feeds you want to feed into this Drupal site, uh, content-wise. Um, and then, really, it's a matter of building views, right? So views are something that we all know. So really, we're using the platform as a data store. Um, it is the database for our video platform. Um, and building simple views, you know, you can build things like, uh, you know, categories. You can render the videos. Render those those categories of videos, or just the categories themselves. Um, and then building this, so there's something funny that happens. So we built this module back at the beginning of the year, and some of you might be saying, "Well, there's already a platform module out there." Well, that's true. They came out with theirs about a week after we came out with ours. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, though. So right now we're actually working with the platform to. Uh, to be able to put the features that we need back into the core contributed module. So this went from not just being an internal open source thing that we're going to use inside of our company, we're actually helping the platform uh, extend that module to meet our model. Their model is a little bit different. They imported all those
those videos into Drupal as nodes or images. Um, and we decided to go a different route because we have so many videos um, across you know, all of our properties. It made more sense to just use the platform as a data source. So um, we're working with the platform to be able to have both. So if you want to pull those in as entities and you know, have all that Drupal functionality, or if you just want to do those data source, you can. Um, so that's really a way that we could go across, you know, across the company and the Drupal community to be able to make something better. And it's really helped our, out our team. Our team runs so much more efficiently now um, that we're on the publisher platform or the you know, Drupal 7 platform. Um, we're able to take stuff from other, you know, other people in the company are doing great things as well. And we're able to utilize that. Um, so it's really got us to a place where we can actually manage all those stuff that I, I showed you earlier that we're working on. Thank you very much. All right. So I have a question for everyone. And so of course I should introduce myself. I'm Adam Ashman. So I'm responsible in the organization for the process that we actually follow. Uh, and I also support process that would be imposed on teams. So my real question is, does everyone know what a Ferrari Enzo is? That's a picture of one, so in case you didn't. It's a, a very expensive, it's, they haven't made them for a while, but they're, it's a very expensive limited edition Ferrari that's extremely powerful. It's a, basically a Formula One race car for the street. And a lot of wealthy people bought them. And what's really great about a Ferrari Enzo, it's literally the, one of the most powerful platforms drive on anywhere. And we compare that to our, our Drupal platform. It's one of the most powerful platforms you can build on. Unfortunately, for a lot of the folks that bought the Ferrari Enzo, they got in them thinking, well, I know how to drive a car. And they had a bad experience with it. More Ferrari Enzos were crashed into poles or ran off the streets or uh, don't exist anymore because the people who actually bought them weren't trained properly or didn't have the, the, the system to be able to actually harness the power of the, the car that they bought. And that's how we kind of see uh, how we apply agility to the projects and the products that we actually try to build. Because we want to direct that power of the platform, the inherent value, the potential value of using the Drupal platform into the kinetic value of the products that we build on it, the products that Mike and, and his folks build and the products that Chris built put in the platform. We want to be able to enable experts, the developers who are building, the folks that are coming up with the ideas, to actually push the envelope with using the platform, but still do that within the constraints of a large enterprise organization. And that's what the challenge is. So although we follow an agile process, our agile process is, is uniquely tailored to our needs. So uh, what we've done is, and what we've learned over, over years, basically, is important things that you've probably learned as you do your project. And one of them is understanding that collaboration and understanding the needs of who we're building something for is really, really important. And so just like we, as the Drupal community, uh, our community and our, and our Agile community internally really value a lot of communication and collaboration. But once again, we're trying to actually balance that need of our developers and our dev teams and our product team to be able to build things, build them quickly, build valuable things that that we can actually show people return some investment to the organization, to balance that against the needs of, a, once again, a large organization that has other other constraints. We have constraints about uh, some, you know, legal constraints. We have uh, copyright constraints. We have technology constraints. So our, our idea is to actually take our process and help support what we do so we can actually put that out. And one of the things we learned right away is having multiple individual projects is less valuable than having people work together on so what we like to think of it is we have many teams working on one backlog. And what, we're, what we've done, and if you're not familiar with the backlog, the backlog of Agile is really the, the list of work, the list of things that we're going to build, that we need to build. And it's put into an order that basically says, at the top, we're going to put the most important things and most important might mean most valuable. We're going to do those first. But 
since, as Mike has said, he has a team of two, and there are other small teams around the organization, that we have a lot of small teams, and we wanted to come up with a way to harness those teams to actually act as one big team, just like we do in the Drupal community. So what we've done is we've come up with a way, and we use uh, tools to actually manage our projects. One of them we use is Rally. So although the tool itself isn't important, how we've actually organized the tool is, and what we've done is make sure that the backlog for the core product that Chris is responsible for is, is accessible by all of the teams, including Mike's, that build onto the core platform so that they can actually help each other. They can actually contribute back into the core backlog. They can actually take stories out of the core backlog and do them in their own teams. And that's how we've actually expanded upon the fact that even though we have many small teams around the organization, we're acting like one big extended But that's just not enough, right? So we actually have organized the tools that way. We've agreed that our philosophy is that. But we've actually come up with some steps that we use. And we, once again, the idea is to have a light framework. I mean, when people hear process, and believe me, I know, they get very frightened that we're going to impose all of these arduous chores on them. And there's going to be all this stuff that they have to do to actually get to do their work. And we really believe that working software, people building software, is the most important thing. So we want to actually Increase the amount of time people are doing that and decrease the amount of time people are in meetings or talking about it or thinking about what they want to do. We really want to plan that early and, and often. So what we like to do first is make sure, and these some things seem obvious, and we laugh about it a little now, but uh, you'll hear and you'll probably have very similar experiences that simple things that we think are obvious now to us were not so simple, even as many as just a month ago or two months ago. So when we start the project, when we start talking about working together and building our teams and putting teams together to work on something with a partner, with a client, with one of our uh, teams internally, what we found very often was that we weren't actually always talking about the same thing, surprisingly enough. So we've actually learned over time that a very important step is one of the first things we do when we actually start something is to sit down with the people we're going to be building something for, working with, to very clearly define what it is that our goals are. Um, defining the vision that the business has, because very often when we think of development, we start thinking of the technical solutions of things, and Drupal inherently provides many of the technical solutions for the things that we're going to need, but our businesses aren't always great at defining or explaining exactly what they want to achieve in a way that really helps us do it well the first time. So our goal in the beginning is actually to sit down with them and say, this is what we think you need, this is what we hear you say, let's agree before we even do work understanding about what that is and what the same thing is, as well as putting together criteria for success. So we can actually immediately start managing scope. So what if it's a really big project, some of the ones we do are really big, some of them are very small. Uh, I think everyone here, you know, I've, uh, at the last uh, con I was at in Munich, we had spoke to a lot of folks that had small companies that were starting up to really uh, start building with partners and clients. And one of the, the challenges is really understanding how to manage the scope of what we're doing because just inherently in any project, when we start, we find that scope starts to increase right away, right? Our stakeholders and our partners and our businesses very often start thinking of new stuff as we start building. And we want to be able to manage that in a way. So defining what success means means we know when we're done. And that's one of the things we talk about first. People kind of forget that if we don't set that expectation early, we very often miss the opportunity Finding the benefit and value of everything we're asking out to do is really important. So, obviously, since many of our teams have limited resources, and Chris has a lot of requests going into his team, we have to come up with a way to actually define what we're going to build next. How do we dedicate our resources to the most important thing? And so what we've done is actually, when we write our requirements, we actually put what we think the benefit of that, what building that is. So, for instance, one of the goals of some of our projects is to get people to watch more videos. So when they go to our site, they'll watch more videos than they had previously. So if we say that if we create a video carousel and we create the UX in such a way that we think that it'll encourage people to click on more videos when they're done watching the last one, the benefit of building that thing that way is to increase the number of videos people watch. It's as simple as that. And that's something that our business takes to once it's in production takes a look at and says, oh, okay, based on our numbers before, we're seeing a benefit. We're seeing the benefit we've asked for that we've asked to return to us. All along we're doing this, we're planning and estimating. So at the 
early stage of the project where we're actually defining our goals and our success criteria, we're getting an idea of the, compl the complexity and nature of the work we're going to be doing. So we always work with experts in the room. And at this point, we're not saying it's going to take two weeks or five weeks or six weeks. We're kind of saying that this is a large effort. And a large effort may be four to six iterations. And a medium effort might be two to three iterations. And a small effort might be one to two iterations. So we're actually kind of right from the beginning, starting to size and gauge what, what we're going to be actually delivering. Because it's really important to set those expectations up front. And the earlier in the process we are, the less exact we can be. But we can have some idea of what we want to do and we're not guessing. Once we start working, goal is always to deploy and deliver often, because the more we can actually have feedback from our partners and our clients and our businesses, the better. We learn nothing from the requirement on the piece of paper or the conversation about the thing. We learn a lot from actually people interacting with it and seeing if it works for them, if it does what we're expecting it to do. The sooner, the better. I've been involved in some projects that uh, they didn't actually do it that way. They kind of just built stuff. They missed their deadlines. And then they wonder later why nothing's really happening, why they didn't get what they wanted. They didn't organize it in a way to actually get that stuff out there and get feedback from it right away. And that's really important. Very often, we won't get the result we expect. I was involved with a project that we needed to reduce the amount of time that somebody was talking to a customer service person on the phone. And one of the things a customer service person was doing was taking all of their personal information. And it took about 15 minutes for a person on the phone to do that. And it costs exorbitant amount of money for someone to be on the phone for 15 minutes. So we built a form that made sense. Built a form for people to actually enter their personal information online, and then they can actually speak to someone, and it, we expected pretty obviously that would reduce the amount of time they were on the phone with that person by 15 minutes. And when we put that out there, it didn't. It reduced the amount of time they were on the phone by 5 minutes. So something was wrong. We knew it took 15 minutes to do this. We knew we had them pulling it out online. And it turned out, in this case, very simply, that the new the form did not cascade across all of the servers in the organization. So most people weren't getting it. There was a small fraction of people. But when we look at these benefits, when we actually define what it is that we expect to get out of it, and then we track it, it gives us some clue, some trail to actually say, what is this? Is it a technical issue? Is it a, another issue? Did we design the page properly? Are people using it the way we want them to use it? And so we at least start somewhere, and we have some way Managing scope by value is a concept that's really hard for some folks because traditionally, very often, we do easy things first that we want to build, right? So we know we can knock these five things out and they'll be done, and that'll be great, we'll, we'll get them out the door, and our customer will be happy. But what happens very often when we do that is we leave the big, really complex things for last. And so when we talk about Agile in our organization, we talk about when we have the most time to do something, which is the beginning of a project. So look for those complex things, those things that may have more risk, but we need, we think we're going to need more time for, do that first. When we have questions of whether we can get something complete, we talk about what's the most valuable thing to do next and manage our scope that way. No business person ever said, no, I don't want that really valuable thing, give me that thing that offers no value. For it's a good conversation to have when we have to actually manage by scope and have to get something out the door when we have a hard deadline and we have a lot of hard deadlines Imagine we have a lot of times during the year when a show is going live on the air, a campaign is going out, so we don't have flexible, oh, we can just keep building this forever, but we have to talk about maybe sometimes not every feature or function getting out of the world. Speeding feedback and backlog obviously comes from the fact that once it's out there and we get that feedback, we immediately write stories and requirements that we can follow up and tweak that. Innovation comes from the ability to get things back into, into production quickly, get metrics from them take risks, and then get it back into the backlog to start tweaking again. You can't innovate without the speed you need to get things in and out of production quickly. And planning and estimating again, because this is a big deal for us, and I know it's a big deal for a lot of folks that do any projects, but we are estimating and planning all of the time. We're refining our requirements all of the time. We're making sure that the needs of our businesses are being met all of the time. And we're planning and estimating all of the time, because at this point in the process, we're at a deeper level of uh, of what we're doing, we really understand better now. So this estimate now is closer to what it's going to be one iteration or two iterations or three iterations of what we're going to be doing here. We're getting more exact. So the first one was kind of a size thing. This one is actually a more of an exact one. 
once again, we're help, we're working with people and Chris and Mike and other folks. We're working for people to understand that estimates change based on us doing work. So our first estimate comes from talking about what we're going to do in an estimate on paper. The second estimate comes from actually working in the system. It's more exact. And we're getting people to understand that, what the difference of those things are, and managing expectations once again. We're, we're trying to move away from how long something's going to take and try to move towards how valuable the thing is you're going to get as soon as you get it. It's a better conversation to have. And lastly, uh, this is something that all of us in this community are very familiar with. We do a lot of retrospectives. We do a lot of introspection and thinking what is working is part of our process. There's no separation between what we do and how we actually define and consistently improve what we're trying to do. So we identify what's working. Every iteration we talk about what's working here. What or do, are we doing well? What seems to be really flowing and really giving us a good result? And we want to understand even more importantly what isn't working. Because we only we do things in two iterations, the worst thing that can happen is we try something new and it doesn't work for two weeks. It's a very low risk thing to do. And we build that improvement into our process consistently and constantly so we can always improve. So the process that I'm responsible for everyone understanding is not actually a rigid process, it's a flexible framework. Think of it as a net rather than a cage. And basically what we want to do is contain the needs we have with the business needs we have with the power of the platform, but be very flexible about how things work in the organization so we don't actually block or, or obstruct the work getting done. We have to actually support and augment the ability for us to do more and better. So that's, that's just for me, that's what I do in the organization. I think Chris is going to have a few thoughts. So I'll just uh, wrap it up and then we can take some questions. Um, I think, uh, I hope it's pretty clear that all of these components sort of contribute to the success of the product. Um, at the end of the day, you couldn't do any single one on, your own, on their own. Of course, we needed a technical capability to be able to share effort throughout the company, and that's what Drupal brought to the table. But we also needed, you know, a communication mechanism, and I feel like that's the biggest benefit that my core team has brought uh, to this overall effort, which is just that continuous communication about what's going on with the product to just foster collaboration so that we are reducing effort um, across the entire company. And then, of course, as Adam said, you really need uh, a process to sort of contain it and drive everyone in the same direction towards innovation and building something that's very valuable for the company. Um, like I said, I, I, you know, I liked Mike's example about uh, building that platform uh, module specifically because without this process and without um, without having Drupal really as a base foundation for doing this sort of thing. There, there's no way that that would have happened, right? Because Mike built that module, contributed it to our core product. It is now used by over six other major brands throughout the company. And it continues to be improved and maintained by our core team. Mike doesn't have to worry about maintaining it. If we introduce a new module that perhaps creates a conflict with the module that he originally contributed, our core team takes care of that. You know, without all of these various pieces you've heard about today, including the communication mechanisms, the documentation, the process that we had, that couldn't happen. Mike, there was no way that Mike was going to work with, I mean, Mike at Sci-Fi or his team was going to work with Bravo. That just, just wasn't going to happen. They had their own businesses, their own focus. We really needed the central core team to sort of drive that effort forward and a, and a process, as Adam mentioned, to make sure that it actually happened. So, um... That's really all I have. There's, by the way, there's several of our core team members in the room. Um, so afterwards, if you want to find them and, and ask them a question, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, core team members, please do. Um, and uh, we're really proud of what we built. So um, I get an opportunity on a stage like this to thank them. They're not all here, but thank you guys very much. It's been it's been great. So we'll turn it over and. Uh, brave soul of Drupal Town. Yeah, i gotta got to break the ice here. Yes, thank you. Um, so this is something we're kind of going through. So certain aspects of the business that we work with, they've been very amenable to the approach, like getting everything into one uh, backlog and working agile. Other aspects have not been. Uh, they've been very hesitant. They want to stick the uh, 
waterfall methodology we've been using. Uh, oh, waterfall so. feels safe, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, wait, like, what Until you're going over it. What? Until you're going over it. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> crashing into the rocks below. Um, but so, so how did you go about kind of, like, getting people, um, you know, amenable to this idea of working, yeah. you know, on a different time scale and uh, transparency? That's a good question. I think um, I'll let Adam take a shot at this as well, but I think the real key there is um, I think a little history is in order to answer that. I mean, we've really tried uh, lots of other uh, content management systems in the past, and we've tried um, the waterfall method in the past, and really nobody was happy. I mean, at the end of the day, no executive was happy, no manager level was happy, no developer was happy. Everyone was generally unhappy. So, you know, we just really, I mean, I must say it, it helps to have managerial um, buy-in and support at the very, very top, and that we do have that, so that really helps. It ha helps shield the team from all that political turmoil. They just sort of focus on activity. But um, I think um, failure is key. You know, fail a few times and show them that waterfall doesn't work and say, you know, can we at least just try this once? You know, let's just try it for a few months and see if, see if things are better in three months from now. I've never seen waterfall really work very well, literally, not once. So I don't know if you have any other thoughts well, about that. Well, it's funny because uh, two things are important. One is, is, is that Chris said, top down support is critical. Uh, ground up work, top down really is important for organization. It takes time. If we've been officially introduced doing Agile, moving towards Agile, close to two years ago. And in some, in some ways, we're just hitting our stride. So saying the word for the first six months because people were really sort of hesitant about it. We had tried it, not really, but we had tried, tried it in various areas of the company before and it really didn't go that well. So. I learned that the funniest thing is when we introduced the term of the Scrum Master, yeah. that people didn't like the word Scrum Master so much we had to change the name to Iteration Manager. Yeah. Because people didn't want to be called Scrum Master. So you do what you have to do. Embra the embrace job. the ideals, don't embrace, you know, the rigidity or in how you deal with UX or design resources that might not be as dedicated to the Agile process as your team might be. Sure. If you mm. had to deal with that. That's an excellent mm. question. That's we an deal awesome with that every question. Day. But the fact is, here's what we've done. So part of my responsibility is actually the format and the form and the quality of the requirements we do. This might be someone in the back room that's an expert at this, who's on my team and is responsible for UX and Agile requirements. But what we've actually talked about is, first of all, we've had a that design, is, visual design, is different than UX. Very often we confuse those things, and that becomes an issue very often. But the second thing we've done is we've created a, a way of part of our, the way we do our requirements is we're 
very acceptance criteria heavy. And those acceptance criteria are also the U.S. So the U.S. annotations uh, become the acceptance criteria. So we combine those things into our requirements, and we're trying to encourage U.S. as part of this iteration process, part of the team, designed to work uh, in a parallel state, uh, but doesn't have to be part of the same iteration. So that's one way we can try to achieve that. But it, it's a challenge very often. It's definitely a challenge. The, other, the only thing I would add to that is uh, I like, uh, and Adam was the one who came up with this line originally, original, but we'll give them credit for it, is that UX should be sort of a visual manifestation of the requirement. It's not the requirement. Right. It's a representation of the requirement. And you, you sort of have to drive that message home to people. I mean, it's uncomfortable for UX designers and visual designers. But you know what? Responsive web design is making a lot of things uncomfortable for them. And, you know, the, the idea of the pixel-perfect comp is gone, in, in our opinion. So it's time to start thinking. We like cars. The difference between a concept car, when you see one at the auto show, and well, you're actually going to get, right? like, so the Chevy Volt is a great example. The concept car was stunning. I did the most futuristic, stunning looking thing. The car they built is kind of stinky compared to that. And they, so what they did, and what we do often, is put these picture perfect pictures in front of executives and say, here, and their expectations are, oh, it's going to be the most beautiful, amazing thing ever. But once we actually have to apply the technology limitations that we have, it's not quite the same thing. And so we, we try to immediately start with grayscale and wireframe and a little bit of a comp, but something that doesn't immediately, you know, change the expectations of or, or misinform people of what they're actually going to get. Good question, though. It's a challenge for our industry, quite frankly. I think I, I have something to add to that. So um, there's this great book out there called Lean Um Creativity is the author of right now. Cross my mind. But there's a, there's a great quote in that book. It's the, the, the biggest lie in corporate America is Dave Stu. Once designers see that their stuff are getting iterated and actually completed, they're more apt to do more cool stuff. So before they hand us a comp to developers, we look at that comp and be like, nope, we can't do that, 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 and that, and that. We'll, we'll save that for phase two. And phase two <laughs> never happens, ever. So, but if we can bring them into the process earlier to be able to iterate through those things to say, okay, today we're going to Yeah, there's nothing more powerful than showing a working, you know, area of a page or a system that's, that's designed well as opposed to just showing them a comp. I really hope, you know, maybe a year from now when DrupalCon is in New York, right? Is that where it's going? Um, I really hope we're talking about, um, you know, this idea that I mean, we don't even show anything up there anymore. You know, we should be showing clients or stakeholders or, you know, whoever has to get final sign off. We should be showing them. Let them react to it. Let them give, give them the URL. Don't even show them anything. Just tell them to go to it on their favorite device and give us some feedback on, on how it should work or what they think. That's going to be so much more powerful, so much more valuable. Um, and I just think it, it really will help drive our entire industry forward. So I hope that's happening here. Any other questions? We have nine minutes before the great Anthony Ferrara takes over. And he will. Hi. Um, I work with a large uh, nonprofit in Washington. We have a core brand site, and we have a variety of microsites as well. Mm -hmm. um, we are rolling into a Drupal implementation for the core site. Um, it's going to apply to a lot of our content management aspects there. We haven't got it on e-commerce yet. Um, but we have not got it on our microsites. And one of the things I'd love to hear your feedback on is what did it look like for you to uh, engage with some of your internal brands and help them to re-platform um, onto a Drupal instance? Yeah, okay. Um, well, um, so it depends on the brand is, 
is really the answer. It, it wasn't, uh, we don't have a single um, shot approach to how we engage brands in this effort. So I'd say Mike uh, and the sci-fi team is really on one of those spectrum because they have very good um, Google skills within their own brand. So we really could, you know, spin up an instance of um, our cloud environment and install a publisher there, give them the keys, give them access to GitHub, and we were sort of off and running. And um, for the platform module that uh, his team built, um, they actually built that as part of our iterations. They literally joined our team for, I believe it was three iterations to build that out. Um, so that worked really well for them. Now, another brand on the other end of the spectrum has zero technical capability. So we have to help them out with additional resources Sometimes that comes from a vendor or a partner of ours, and we have a few sort of in our arsenal that we have agreements with that we could just, you know, give them this opportunity to go work with this brand and build out that smaller or big site sometimes. Um, but other times we use internal development, uh, site building, and theming resources. Um, I think the, the hard part, and this is sort of where we're at right now, is keeping everyone sort of contained within this ecosystem because it's very easy to go, oh, that platform module doesn't do exactly what I want. I'm just going to build my own, right? Um, that's the struggle sort of going forward now that we have really good traction. Um, there's no easy answer there. I think uh, innovation re sort of requires a little bit of chaos to a certain degree. So it depends. I, I can't really answer because I don't know your organization well enough, but I think it depends on the capability. And, and I think the more you can get them involved and, and have them take ownership, the more successful everyone. Others, come on, brave souls. It's not embarrassing. All right, well, I think we'll shut it down. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming. And like I said, seek out any of the other team members if you have any other questions. Thanks.